So good afternoon, everybody. It is good to be together. Um, so I just have to say, I have really been blessed so far today by what I have received and been able to be a part of. I don't know how people felt about the keynote address, but that just really, ooh, it's really sitting with me. Um, and is just really blessed by Shan and Jennifer as they talked about, not even so much talked about, but also just testified about the life of forgiveness in family, in ministry, uh, and in the world. And I have been feeling like, which, I, which is not uncommon for me, but I have been feeling like, oh, I wish that there were another hour or two to just be quiet together and ask a question or two and be quiet together and let some, let some answers unfold, but that's not the way these conferences go. And so instead what I'll do is just open us with a little bit of breath prayer to get us started. So I invite you to sit in whatever way feels comfortable to you and welcome to those of you who are out there on the live stream, whatever way feels comfortable to you to hold your body, it's customary in many contexts to sit with both feet flat on the ground um, and an erect spine. You might want to try to lift the top, the crown of your head, which you can do by just tilting your chin down ever so slightly. For some of us, that is not a comfortable position. And so if it is not for you, find and inhabit the one that does work. And just take a minute to find your breath in this moment. And as you begin to settle into its natural rhythm, the next time you inhale, you might just say, the temple of God is holy. And the next time you exhale, which temple I am. Inhale, the temple of God is holy. <coughs> exhale, which temple I am. On your next inhale, you might say, surely the presence of the Lord was in this place. And on your exhale, and I did not know it. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. and I did not know it. On your next inhale, I am an image of the glory of God. On 
on your next exhale. And I will not deny my suffering. I am an image of the glory of God. And I will not deny my suffering. Let us pray. Spirit of God, Holy Sophia, we thank you for your presence in this place. This place that is not just this physical room, but reaches out and out to the people under my voice on the live stream, people in other workshops. God, we know that we are each here for a purpose. Some of us think we have something to say. Some of us yearn for something to hear. But may it all be to your greater glory, to the renewal of your creation. I ask you to calm my nerves. For this is not about me, but about your good work in each of us. And give us the courage to wrestle as Jacob did with your angel until we receive a blessing through these trials and these tribulations that so often shape our lives. We breathe in. We breathe out. Ah. So, once again, welcome everybody. My name is the Reverend Ajwa Wilson, and I was reading over my description of this workshop, and I have to say, I was like, what does that mean? So I look forward to figuring it out together but we're gonna be basically talking about what is a sapiential, and I'll go into that word a little bit later, but what I really mean is what is a wisdom approach? What is a wisdom approach to liberation? Um, First, for those who suffer, and then after that, and through the suffering for all of us, for the whole of the world, and in fact, for all of creation. So as we start, this is, Lucille Clifton, and I'd like you to listen to a poem of hers. I was going to read it to you, but then I thought, you know what, let's hear it in her own voice. And so I invite you to listen, and as you listen, pay attention for a word or a phrase that captures your attention, that captures your imagination. Listen for her mood. What does it evoke in you? Tech help. Isn't that magic, (laughs) y'all? Oh, yes, thank you. There it is. Right? Isn't that a fun trick? Thank you, Bill. I appreciate it. So good. Let's just, just a minute. $2.5 million. No, it doesn't always work. Okay. So what is the mood? What words or phrases capture your attention? Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life? I had no model, 
Born in Babylon, both non-white and woman, what did I see to be except myself? I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay, my one hand holding tight my other hand. Come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. So I'll play that one more time. Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life? I had no model. Born in Babylon, both non-white and woman, what did I see to be except myself? I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay, my one hand holding tight my other hand. Come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. A word or a phrase, an experience, a sensation in your body as you hear that. Powerful, thank you. Joyful. Mm. She held her own hand because there was no one else to celebrate with her. Hands are important. Amen. Thank you. Somebody else spoke at the same time. I didn't hear that. Favorite. Favorite? Yeah. Favorite. Uh huh. Thank you, Sarah. Defiance. Defiance. Mood of victory in battle. Amen. Unexpected joy. Unexpected joy. So I want to read, um, after hearing Lucille's poem, I'd like to read now a prayer. And if you were in this workshop last year, you'll know that this prayer was written by an unknown prisoner at Ravensbrook concentration camp, which was a women's concentration camp during the whole Holocaust. And I'm going to ask you the same questions. I'll read it twice, and I invite you into the same questions. What word, phrases, images come up for you? What is the mood? What does it evoke inside of you? O oh Lord, remember not only the men and women of good will, but also those of ill will. But do not remember all the suffering they have inflicted on us. Remember the fruits we have brought thanks to this suffering. Our comradeship, our loyalty, our humility, our courage, our generosity, the greatness of heart which has grown out of all this. And when they come to judgment, let all the fruit which we have borne be their forgiveness. O oh Lord, remember not only the men and women of good will, but also those of ill will. But do not remember all the suffering they have inflicted on us. Remember the fruits we have brought thanks to that suffering. Our comradeship, our loyalty, our humility, our courage, our generosity, 
the greatness of heart which has grown out of all this. And when they come to judgment, let all the fruits which we have borne be their forgiveness. A word or a phrase, an image, In the midst of all that suffering, the word fruits. Thank you. Be their forgiveness. Vicarious suffering. Thank you. Courageous compassion. Thank you. Community. Oh, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. She said she had the image of a light that will not go out in the midst of all of the darkness. Thank you. How do you feel as you hear that? Prayer. That real prayer in that real context, how do you feel? Challenged? Mm. Say more about the, the, the aching, the pull and aching, you said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it feels like something is, is drawing you into its movement. It's inviting your participation. Thank you. Is, says, absolutely not humanly possible, but with God, all things are possible. That does kind of feel like an all things, doesn't it? It feels sort of miraculous. So is anybody like, I'm out. I don't know what she's going to be talking about, but I got to go. <laughs> anybody? I mean, myself a little bit. I love, I love this, this prayer. This prayer has been a part of my consciousness and my psyche probably for 10 years. And it captivates me. It challenges me. It pulls out the best in me. It makes me want to rage and go crazy. I just can't understand it. Um, and it speaks to me of liberation. Both the poem that we heard and this prayer speak to me of liberation. They speak to me of an inner compass and ground of being inside the speaker that cannot be quenched. It is inviolable. No one can victimize it. Nobody can take it. And it has kind of like the fire of God. I don't know what it is that it draws out. That's exactly right. But it draws something out that, that I just, it says to me that there is a freedom available in this world, in the life of the spirit, that is not predicated on what happens that anybody else does. And I have been, my imagination has been captivated by, so what is that kind of liberation? What is that? Where does that come from? So as we spend this afternoon together, I thought it would be worthwhile for me to share with you some of my credentials and qualifications for being here with you. I wasn't on the panel, so I'll have to do that for myself. Um, and there are three that I want to bring up. 
because my qualifications, of course, have nothing to do with where I go to school or where I work or whatever. They have to do with whether or not I am credible as a sufferer because I'm going to make some claims and I am exploring some things about the role of suffering. And I'm gonna ask you, as you listen, to be in tune with your own qualifications as a sufferer. Because we're not doing academic work here together, right? This is a conference on contemplative practice. So we're looking for a spirituality that has the possibility, the potential to change the world. And if we don't credential ourselves as people participating in that struggle, it's gonna be really hard to make the leap when we leave this place. So my three credentials that I'm working with right now or will offer um, for today, one is just the racial crisis. So when I came into the contemplative life and contemplative practice, one of the ways that I did that was through monastic exploration. And one of the things I found out really quickly in monastic exploration in my denomination is that it's almost entirely white. And I was okay with that because I'm also educationally very privileged, so I'm used to being around a lot of white, and I live in New England, so you know, white. It was all fine. But what actually happened was that I came into a collision course with myself as a racial being. In that sort of pressure cooker, I could not deny that part of myself that I was running away from. The fact that I'm not just any old human being, I am a human being in brown skin, and that has many gifts and many graces and so much beauty of beautiful lineage, and it has a lot of oppression, some of which is just so subtle and permeates the most progressive spaces, right? Like, like right here, um, that it is, it's maddening. And so when I came out of the monastery, and I now work in a very progressive denomination in a very progressive part of the world, I came to realize quickly, 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 that there was no way I could escape race. There was no way I can escape race being a part of my ministry. Even if I don't want to talk about it directly, if every time I'm in the room, I'm the only black person in the room, race is on the table. So that's the first crisis. How do I know myself as a child of God when everybody's talking about race right now and when I'm not on the right side of the line in terms of the benefits of this society? And is there anything that God has to offer to me and to the world through my blackness? So that's the first one. Um, the second one that I'll name is body crisis and I deal with some chronic body dysfunction that um, in cycles involves some pretty significant pain. Right now, those, I'm in a lower cycle on pain, still in a fairly high cycle of dysfunction. But that also um, was connected to me, that's predated it, but connected to, for me to some failures around vocation. So in particular, when I left the monastery where I hadn't been sleeping and I hadn't been eating and I was just really emaciated and I left there and I was brokenhearted and I get in my car and the first thing I did was total my car and deploy my airbags into my gut, which is one of my places of difficulty. So really significant body collision. So for me, there's the issue of what does it mean to be a middle-aged person living in a body that's in crisis, right? That's one of my primary places of actual physical suffering. And then for me also there was, as I said, the vocational crisis. So the idea that I jumped two feet in into something that, that asked a lot of me. It asked me to give up my resources and all of those things. And I came out of the other side as, let's say, a, a failure. I didn't do what I had intended to do. It broke my heart. So I left with the suffering of a, and the existential suffering of a broken heart. All of these are my own suffering, but they also speak to some crises that we have in our religious life and in our communal life. So they're happening both in me and they're happening beyond me. 
And I mention that because as we move forward, I really invite you to just take a moment to locate where are your places of suffering and crisis. Where are your places of suffering and crisis that speak to some of the suffering and the crisis and the pain of the world that we live in? And you don't have to share that out loud. I just invite you to think about it. Enable yourself to be really present with me in this room today. So, I want to engage us in a little bit of Bible study. And I'll start with Matthew 25. People are familiar with Matthew 25, sheep and goats. Okay. So, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a sheep separates the sheep as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you. And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. So what's the point of the passage? What have you learned or taken in about this passage? And what do you see here? said, okay, or as a younger man, mm-hmm. I'm going to be judged if I don't feed the homeless. And I, 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 I suspect there's something to it, but I see the collectivity mm-hmm. that, that it's not so much an individual call to condemnation, but a uh, collective judgment on our systems, on our nations, mm-hmm. on, our, on our group pride, our group ego. That, and that saves it for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, because then it seems e- it's easy to lapse into judgment mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or to lapse into self-congratulations. Right. Hey, I did, I I did it. I'm shoulder. okay. That's right. That's right. Yeah, That's right. That's uh, right. That's right. No, I, I love that idea that in a sense we're all on the same boat. Mm-hmm. And, it, and, it, and when it capsizes, we're all going down. Mm-hmm. And so anyway, so that's, uh, that's how I read it. Thanks, Andrew. So you see the collective call here that Jesus is saying, all y'all, pay attention. What you do to the least is what you're doing to me. So America, how are you doing right now? You know, England, how are you doing right now? Congo, how are you doing, et cetera. Yeah. What else do people see? Mm-hmm. So some of it was a surprise. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but there's a su- the surprise comes from the fact that we're doing things that serve others, and we, we find the surprise that actually we've been entertaining angels all along, right? We've been entertaining 
and caring for Jesus. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. I see the need to visit my family more, the ones who are silently suffering or can use my presence somehow. And also, I also see that the knowledge of God's mystery is hidden from the truly righteous ones. We will be surprised by the people we have helped when we find out that it was Jesus all along. We will be surprised at where Christ was present all along. Mm -hmm. Angels all along. I love that. Beautiful. Thank you. We'll be surprised at where Christ was all along, angels all along. And thank you, Parker, also for um, just bringing it home to where you're feeling called to take in that care and that shut in, in particular right at home with the people in your family who are maybe quietly suffering. So thank you for that. Is there anything else that's common for people in the ways that they've heard or received this passage? Mm. So, what's your name? Uh, Char. Char. Charin? Just Char. Char. Yeah. Thank you, Char. So Char is pointing out that nowhere does the Son of Man here speak about conversion or faith. Thank you. So let's read another passage. And this is from John 9. This is only part of it. John is the kind of writer who writes in riddles and enigmas, um, but he also teases out stories. He really gives you large, large vignettes. So chapter nine is actually all about this man who was born blind. And I suspect that it's another passage that's familiar for people. So as Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back, able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, it is he. Others were saying, no, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, he is a prophet. For the second time, they called the man who had been blind and they said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. Then they reviled him saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. So what do you see in this passage? What messages have you been taught about this passage? 
what does it bring up for you? Mm, thank you. So Deborah is saying that she's wanting to know how to ask for eyes to see and negotiate for, towards a just life. Thank you. Mm. Mm. Aren't we like that sometimes? We're asking all the questions, but we don't actually want to hear anything. Yes, 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 yeah, yes. So you are pointing out something that the ones who are, um, it's not necessarily that the, the people who are questioning the Pharisees, they did not make this person blind, but part of the oppression is that they won't let him be unblind. They can't seem to see and accept what has happened. And that has something to do with their own identity, their own place of being stuck. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? To be, to be sent into the pool, to be washed, to be sent to the waters to be washed, mm -hmm. and to be sent away from the pool. What is that? Yes. Have been washed to the waters. Yes. So he's sent to Siloam to wash, and he's sent from Siloam, uh, evidently, to teach. Beautiful, thank you. Anything else? Yes, Sarah. I'm just wondering when Jesus spits on the ground, if he means anything, if it's just functional, you know, it's a miracle, or if he really means something. I, I don't know. Thank you. It's not particularly relevant to what we're going to talk about today, but just a little aside. In the ancient world, that happened to be one of the ways that people did healings, like doctors and witch doctors and all the folks. They would sort of take some earth and spit on it, and they would put it as like a salve on people. Personally, I happen to like the idea of Jesus taking something from the earth of which we are made and mixing that with himself and pouring that on the place. But also notice that's not actually where the healing happens. The healing happens when the man is sent goes where he's sent and comes back able to see, right? Yeah. Hi, my name is Michael. I, I just noticed like, like the very first line you have and the very last line you have. So the question they ask is, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? Beautiful. And then in the end, you were born entirely in sin and you're trying to teach Beautiful. us. Beautiful. And their response Beautiful. is just to drive them out. Beautiful. Like, you're, you're in sin. Beautiful. We're, not, we're not even going to have a conversation that that somehow broken through with this healing or anything like you're in sin and in our very neat world yes yes we just can't about. yes well so you know i was in trenton coming up here i had to my my train landed in trenton and i you know took the transit up and one of the things i noticed was as i was in the subway station, just walking around, there was a cop there, and he wouldn't look at anybody. He wasn't looking at anybody, but he was just walking, saying, go outside, go sit outside, go sit outside. He wasn't even looking to the homeless, looking in the face of the homeless folks who were there. He wasn't looking at anybody indirect, directly, but it was clear what he was saying. This public space is not public to you. You are unclean, right? So I do wonder how many of us, you know, we see somebody who is involved in drug addiction. We see somebody who is involved in stealing. We see somebody who's involved in all sorts of things. And we can say, you know, you were entirely born in sins. And we don't look at that systemic piece that Deborah was talking about or that collective condemnation that Andrew was talking about. What is our role in that? Even when people want healing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So this contrast with blindness, being blindness, mm -hmm. what is the true blindness? Mm -hmm. like, it's quite ironic, the one who's physically blind, have simple face, mm -hmm. and where is the 
those who uh, think they can see, but they actually they don't see. That's right. Samantha from the chat agrees. She says, classic image of those who are perceived to be blind see most clearly. And Parker says, they said he was born entirely from sin. They couldn't have been more wrong. That's exactly right. And I love that. I love that Jesus makes clear that's not, that's not what this is about. That's not what this is about. So let me share with you a poem. At the center of every crisis is an inner space, so deep, so beckoning, so suddenly and daringly vast that it feels like a universe, feels like God. When the unthinkable happens and does not relent, we fall through our hubris toward an inner flow, an abiding and rebirthing darkness that feels like home. Barbara Holmes is um, one of my muses at the moment. People mostly know her for this book, Joy Unspeakable, which talks about the contemplative practices of the black church. The book that has actually been most transformative for me is this book called Crisis Contemplation, um, which looks at what contemplation means within a village or a people or a time that is in crisis. So a pandemic or the environmental crisis or, you know, blackness. I would say I'm not the one having the crisis, but that's another story. And so she, has, she writes some beautiful um, poetry. And in addition to the poetry in that book, she also gives a number of spiritual practices that can be used by individuals as well as by communities. And I will bring up some of those towards the end. But so I'll sprinkle this presentation with poems, many or some from her. And this one, I think, really speaks to, um, speaks to my thesis of where we are and how we can think about suffering. So I first want to start, about, start with saying some of the ways that I think that we do think about suffering in the church. What are some of the theologies that we have about suffering in the church? And I want to start with the most abusive ones first, because that's a thing. There are a lot of abusive theologies of suffering in the, in the church. You might have heard sort of, if somebody slaps you on the right cheek, turn them the left other. If somebody gives you your, asks for your tunic, you give them your cloak or the other way around, you know, all of that. Turn the other cheek. Stay in this relationship because by it you might save your spouse. This is the kind of theology that has said, you know, oh, well, Paul didn't say that slaves should be freed. Therefore, slaves, obey your masters. It says it right there in the text. Or if you've been divorced because you were abused or something like that, then you can't possibly receive the rights of the church. It says it right there in the text. I mean, it doesn't, but that's, that's the way that it goes. So they're the abusive theologies that the system of the church, unfortunately, has used and cultivated for, since its existence. And that's part of the legacy for which I just want to say, as a minister of the church, we owe repentance. And we owe repentance to folks, not just because of the physical harm and the identity harm that we've done, but we owe repentance because our choice to do that has alienated people from the spiritual wholeness that they could have from God. It's alienated them from wanting to try. So I just want to go ahead and name the abusive ones right off the bat. But I think that they're also, um, at our best, we have prophetic traditions in the church. And so the prophetic traditions in the church, I would say that those are the ones like, well, the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah. I think the one we love the most is Micah 6, 8. What do I desire of you, O mortal, right? But to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with the Lord your God. When we see Jesus turning over tables in the temple, I think we're talking about the prophetic voice, right? This is the acceptable fast 
to loose the bonds of injustice. Let justice roll down like water. That's the prophetic tradition. And I think the church is doing increasingly a good job, especially the progressive church, the mainline church, of at least trying to move in this direction. So the prophetic tradition, I would say, is the one that speaks for the sufferer, speaks for the oppressed, for the marginalized. And it's got a number of strengths. It says that worldly justice is important. It's important to God. It is the context of God's kingdom. God's, God's eschaton will look like a just world. And we don't have to wait for it. God calls us God's children when we participate in bringing about what God hungers for, which is justice and righteousness and peace, shalom, deep shalom for the whole creation. So that's the prophetic realm. And I think that the church is pretty good at that. I do want to say for myself personally that I feel like there are some liabilities to the prophetic realm. And so I'll just name that the racial crisis that, I've experienced, that I experience in large part is actually not because of the racialized injustice that I experience, which is its own thing. It's because I'm exhausted about being bound into a stock story of victimhood. I'm exhausted that every time a white person gets woke, they want to tell me about it. That's exhausting. I can imagine that that's also true for people of non-normative genders, non-normative cognitive patterns, non-normative sexualities. There's a way in which it's just exhausting to have that mantle on all the time. I also think that we run a danger here of shrinking the imagination. So one of the things that Barbara Holmes writes, which I just, I just love, she says that prey runs from predators. And so without realizing it, as we spiritually and actively seek to escape the clutches of white supremacy, so for herself as a black woman, she's speaking about race, as we spiritually and actively seek to escape the clutches of white supremacy, we begin to think of ourselves as hapless victims of a prowling beast that cannot be stopped. When parents of BIPOC children give the talk today, we are teaching our children to survive predation. We have to imagine more. One of the challenges I think for the prophetic sometimes is that we can get so caught up in the problem that we forget that there's already a wholeness and a goodness in us that cannot be taken. We can forget some of what was talked about in today's beautiful keynote speech about um, the gifts, the resilience. As that prayer says, all of those things, those fruit that we have brought through what has happened to us. So to be clear, when I say the story of slavery is not my story, I am saying that's not something I'm going to take on as my mantle. The story of slavery, the story of people killing black men, police killing black men and things like that, that's a story of the system. That's the story of whiteness. That's not my story. And sometimes the prophetic, when we do our justice work, I think we get so caught by that one narrative that those of us who are suffering, take on the additional suffering of making that our story. And then we tell ourselves that we can't have liberation or freedom unless we get the justice that has been given to us. We are already liberated and free, and that is why we have the power to work for the justice that is coming to us. So if the prophetic is the voice of the church or the voice of the community that is speaking to the sufferer, 
I would say that the pastoral, or for the sufferer, I would say that the pastoral is that element of the church and that element of our common practice that is speaking to the sufferer, right? So this is the part where we're thinking about um, what is that person's experience? How do we encourage and console that person? And I tried to think scripturally, what are some examples of the pastoral? And I think one of them is actually something that Jesus receives. So when the women anoint him, when they put oil on his feet or on his head, when they wash him with his, their hair and their tears, and he says, leave to the woman who anointed him in Bethany, leave her alone. She's doing a good thing. She's doing an act of kindness, a mercy for me, anointing me for my burial. And anywhere in the world where, the, where this, this good news is told, what she's done will be told on behalf of me. It's a pastoral moment. She's saying to him, you're not alone. I see you. I can't stop what's going to happen, but I see you, and I can offer you my tenderness. I think that that's why in the Catholic imagination, Veronica's veil is so important, that there's somebody on that trail to the cross who wipes his face and says, I see you. I think also that when the woman, you know, the woman with the hemorrhage, she, gets, she touches him and she gets healed like that. So that could be the end of the story. But then Jesus stops and he asks her what happened and she tells him everything. I think that's an example of the pastoral. This man, this teacher stops and turns to this woman and he talks to her and says, my daughter, I see you. It's so important to him that she be seen, that he lets somebody else die. Now, it turns out he can raise that person from the dead, but he lets something else go to preserve that moment of being seen. So that's the pastoral, and I think that that has the potential for the psychosocial healing. But what I really want to put forward is that I don't think either of those is necessarily on their own liberation. And so I feel like there's a third, which I'm calling the sapiential part of faith, the sapiential part of Christianity. I actually think that this is where liberation resides. So when Clifton says, when Lucille Clifton says, celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed, or when somebody prays let all of our gifts be to their forgiveness, I think they've actually tapped into the sapiential piece. And the sapiential, all that means is wisdom, Sophia. It's actually a personification of God's nature in the Hebrew scripture. Isn't that beautiful that there's a feminine aspect of God that's all over the Hebrew scripture? And I have to say, she is a fierce, beautiful woman. It's just gorgeous. Take some time, go to your Bible, and if you're a Protestant, if you're a foreign Protestant, go ahead and get a Catholic Bible and also check out the other wisdom books. Check out the wisdom of Solomon because she just explodes. It's gorgeous. But wisdom says that whether or not the suffering is alleviated, there is still some truth, some revelation, some intimate contact with God that can be known not to the sufferer and not for the sufferer, but through the sufferer. That there's a revelation of God that is through the sufferer. One of my favorite um, black theologians, J. Roberts Diotis, he says that if the good news is really going to be good news, it can't just be a good news that the person is going to be freed from their injustice. It has to be good news to the slum dweller where they are right now. In other words, the dignity of Christ needs to be available even at the location of suffering. Even in my black body, even in my broken body, even in my failure, there has to be something that is accessible about Jesus, something of dignity in that place. 
This is the place that, in my opinion, breaks out of those stock stories that I am only a victim or that everybody is doing something to me, that I need to cancel those people who don't see things the way that I see them. It's also, I think, the place that allows me to get rid of that story that I am broken because I have been victimized or because I've been labeled a particular way in society, and if only I can overcome that brokenness. Rather, this is like Job, the place that says, even in my suffering, I expect to see God in the flesh, right? And that's one of the things that I love about Job is that he isn't saying, patient Job is just such a lie. He's not saying, oh, whatever you want, God, that ended at chapter two. He actually spends the whole rest of the book wrestling. And in his wrestling, he doesn't deny that God is real. He also doesn't deny that his suffering is real. He sits in that tension until a new theology emerges, emerges, a new revelation of God emerges. This idea of a retributive God that he grew up with, that his friends are trying to tell him, that doesn't make sense if his suffering is not because he's a sinner and he holds tight to that, and if God is just and he holds tight to that, so it means that something else has got to be there. He fights, he fights, he fights fights with God until he gets that answer. And something is revealed. He does see his redeemer face to face, and he's able to say, I only knew about you by hearsay, but now I've seen you face to face. But here's the beautiful thing about the book of Job. We are never told what that revelation is. And I think the reason we're not told what that revelation is is because if we did, we would appropriate it. We would make it into a theology. We would say, oh, great, that's the new thing that is always 100% right. Instead, it is the sufferer who goes through the journey of this kind of spirituality who discovers the dignity of God in their experience and in their suffering, who sees God face to face, and it's through that spirituality that they themselves become a revelation to the community. It's Job who's healed, who comes back and offers healing to his friends. There's this beautiful artwork that's done by Blake, I think, and one of the beautiful things about it is that at the beginning of the book of Job, there's this picture of Job and his family, and they're all very studious, but they are just so dour and boring looking. And at the end, there are all these colors they're dancing, their horns, even the fields are dancing in this image. There's something about the sufferer discovering their dignity right at the site of the, their oppression and their marginalization and their pain, regardless of what the world makes right. There is something about that in and of itself that brings the world alive. Right there is the revelation of God. Right there is Sophia. And that's what we also see, I would say, in some of the servant songs of the suffering, the suffering servant. So as Christians, we're used to seeing that as Jesus as the suffering servant and look at what he did to us. And we're supposed to look at that and feel miserable. But of course, those suffering songs were Israel and the prophet first seeing themselves as suffering in the midst of the nations. The prophet is seeing himself suffering in the midst of Israel. Israel is seeing itself suffering in the midst of the nations, and they're seeing the Messiah suffering with them. So in other words, there's this beautiful dance happening where the nation and the prophet and the Messiah are all suffering together. And it becomes a revelation in the world. Of course, my favorite is my patron saint, Julian of Norwich. She also, you know, she has this beautiful, she's gazing on this crucifix of Jesus because she thinks that she's going to die. She's ha she has a mortal illness. And as she gazes upon the crucifix, she has all of these revelations of God's divine love. 
unconditional love. It blows her mind, right? Because this is not what Holy Church has taught her. How can it be, God? Because I know for sure that I'm a sinner and I'm worthy of damnation, right? That she's rehearsing what Holy Church has taught her. She can't understand, but she can't see that wrath in God. But if you just read her theology, what you don't know from the short text is that while she's gazing on this crucifix of Christ hanging like this, suffocating to death, because that's what happens in crucifixion, she's lying in a bed. She's kind of propped over like this. It's described a little bit in the short text. And she says that as she progresses in her illness, she begins to lose feeling up and up and up and up her body until the worst of the pains is her inability to breathe. She is suffocating. And she had prayed that her pains could be Christ's pains, that she could know Christ's pains in her body. And as she is there, absolutely present to her own suffering, she sees how Christ thirsted and suffocated for us in love. All love. So she's not having a theoretical revelation. The revelation is coming through her body, through her suffering. Which is why I, when I qualify, start by saying that when I, when I explore these ideas, they are real for me in the experience of my race, in the experience of physical pain, in the experience of vocation, because those are the places where God is making manifest God's revelation through me. And that's why I invite you to think about where are those places that you imagine are just God forsaken, but are actually perhaps the place of sapiential liberation. The place where God is not only longing to set you free, regardless of what's happening in the world, but is also wanting to whisper out something of God's self that can only be known from the underside. And not just the abstract underside, but your underside. Let me just stop there for a second. Are there any questions? Does anybody want to throw anything at me yet? So what I wanted to do was go back to those two Bible, study, Bible verses that we had before and just show you two things that, um, show you a couple of things that for me bring out the sapiential. I can say that this is a passage I have known since I was a kid, right? And the thing about this passage that I was taught is that it's important to be Christ-like, it's important to feed and to cl clothe and to house and all of that sort of thing. Jesus himself says, I've come to set the prisoners free and proclaim good news, right? The year of the Lord's favor. So I'm supposed to do all of those things, and that's what will make me Christ-like. That's definitely a story of justice, but it's not necessarily, for me, a story of liberation or revelation. The place where I see that is what is actually already in the text, that Jesus says, when you do this, you do it to me. Which basically means that when you are in the presence of the sufferer, you are actually in the presence of Jesus. For me, this becomes a liberative passage when I recognize that first and foremost, it's not at all about what I do or don't do. It's not about whether or not I'm a sheep or a goat. It's about whether or not I can see that the most anguished place in myself, the place that is naked, the place that has been made to be called the stranger, the place that has been imprisoned because I don't want to set it free, that place is Jesus Christ in me. And that the people in society that we would be prone to say, oh, poor them, woe is them, I can't believe they have to deal with that kind of ridiculous pity that we put on people who are suffering. That that is pity, that we are, that is superiority, that we are holding over the Christ where he dwells in the world. 
So that's the first piece. And again, that's not to say that the justice isn't necessary. It's not important. It's so clear in this passage. The justice is so clear. But what I invite us to see is that undercurrent as well, that Jesus is saying, my revelation is amongst you in exactly that place that is broken or marginalized and that person who is broken or marginalized. You are seeing the invisible most high God in exactly that place. And so likewise with John 9, you know, this is an interesting passage because it's a healing story, clear as day. This is one of Jesus's signs that he heals this man born blind. But interestingly, if you want to get into theology, people often want to talk about this about baptism because there's water involved and all of that. But if we just look at it as a healing, I really just love that it says this is not about sin. And in this case, it's not even about justice. It's about the works of God being revealed, God being revealed in this person. And that's actually what happens because in this passage, which is 41 verses long, this thing happens that doesn't happen really any place else in the Gospel of John, which is that after Jesus does the healing, he just disappears. And the only person who remains to do the teaching, to challenge the community, is the blind man himself. The blind man remains in the community as the proxy to Jesus. It's even embedded in the Greek language itself. You know how Jesus is always saying, I am the bread of life. I am, you know, the, what else does he say? He says, I am the gate, right? I am the good shepherd. Those are a lot of his I am statements. And then at the end, when they come to get him, they say, are you the one that we're looking for? And he says, I am. And they all draw back because what he's actually saying is the divine name, right? Ego in me, it could just mean I am he, which is in fact how it's translated here, I am the man. Or it could be this divine name, it could be something evocative. And so if you've seen my presentation before, you know that actually that, I, I would contend that that is actually the evocative divine name. No translation translates it that way. But I also will point out that there is no other human being in the Gospel of John who uses ego and me in exactly that way besides Jesus. Nowhere. Jesus and the blind man. On top of that, some, of, some people, I love this idea of being sent, right? That name of being sent, it's a, it's a popular name. It's something that John likes to use for Jesus, right? I, the Father has sent me. I am sent from my Father over and over again. And Jesus sends. This man is initiated into this pool called sent. He's initiated into the life and the revelation of Jesus. So to me, these passages are actually doing something subversive. They are talking about justice. They are talking about healing. But they are also talking about how when we enter into a life of prayer, a life of communion with Jesus, that we are also in our suffering becoming a revelation, at least in the flesh, in the way that is possible in this world. We become potential sites of revelation of God's life among us. What breaks my heart about this story is that the man himself is liberated, but the community is not. Because the community wouldn't see him, because the community wouldn't affirm him, because the community wouldn't let go of their narrative that this must be sin. They had so much privilege to lose, they could not listen to him and see his groping and grasping towards the revelation that is unfolding in his own flesh. And so Jesus tells him to follow, and the community remains unchanged. It reminds me of something actually that my colleague Leonard, who is really into Merton, um, as a political figure, actually. So in 
Seeds of Destruction, Merton talks about how the Negro, that's the language he would have used, it is the language he did use, but the Negro as he, that's also the language he used, so the Negro as he finds his own dignity is providing for the potential for the salvation of the white man. And he wonders if the white man will take that salvation. In other words, it starts with the sufferer. It starts with the oppressor, the oppressed. It starts with the marginalized who is able to say, wait a second, I see God in myself. I see that I am a conduit of God's glory. I see that it can't be taken away and I am prepared to speak it out into the community. Will the community bow down and see that as well? So I think one of the best metaphors for talking about, um, actually, before I even go there, can I just pause and ask, how does that change, if at all, how you engage with those sorts of passages? So I was here last year, so there was like some spoilers. But I kind of took a twist on this, and I teach it to my high school kids. Mm. Uh, and in preparing, I looked at the commentaries about the ego and the thing. Yes. And all the commentaries say, oh, Jesus' I am statements in John. And then in parentheses, except for John 9, where it's not referring to <laughs> the divine name. And, and this happens all the time. The commentators say, this means the revelation of God, except for... Isn't it interesting? In Isn't John it God. interesting? And it's so interesting because that's what the Pharisees are doing. Isn't it interesting? <laughs> they can't see that this is, you know, God speaking to them, yeah. teaching them. Yes. And we ourselves in our modern era as commentators also can't see. Yes. You refuse yes. to acknowledge that yes. this man could be speaking for God. Yeah. And so it makes me wonder... You know, what are Amen. my blind Amen. How Amen. am I reading the text as a Pharisee? Amen. <laughs> um, and am I willing to see God speak in places that aren't traditionally associated? With Amen. Hmm. Amen. So I have to say, if, because you were here, you know, right, that I, I mean, I know so little Greek and it's just vanished. So let's say this year I don't know any Greek, but I had to hunt and peck to decide whether or not I really thought that was true, whether or not the ego in me was only Jesus and this person in the whole gospel. I convinced myself I would be happy for somebody to stand up and say that I'm wrong. But I also, in preparing to be here this week, I also took out every commentary I had and I looked at them. And none of them, none of them mention it. In fact, almost none of them mention it even as a liberative text at all. They're so caught up in the idea of the symbolism of John and the baptism imagery and why water is so important, that it's almost like nobody is paying attention to a man who is no longer blind. And when I speak to the pastoral, you know, I talked about the prophetic and the pastoral, I'll also say that there are disability theologians who do address this text, and some of them who are blind, so it's worth, it's worth acknowledging that, actually take great offense as though there's something that is inferior about being blind. So there's a way in which you know, people will want to um, redact or would want to cancel, as it were, this particular text. And there are other and lots of different, I'd say that there are myriad interpretations amongst the disability community, amongst the blind community, all of that. But amongst mainline commentation, commentators, it's not really there. So here's the place where I got to say to all of us at Princeton Seminary, we are not, through our training, reading from the perspective of the sufferer. We're reading the, from the perspective that says, my credentials are that I went here and I have these degrees and I wear this around my neck and my title is and et cetera, et cetera. That's where we're reading from. And I'm saying that that is not where the spirit of the living God speaks from. 
So when we hear a keynote that's talking about the beauty of the spirituals and how the spirituals are tapping into a wisdom that we all need, a wisdom for the world that is coming out of the oppressed that we all need. And when that keynote speaker says, come on guys, we are Christians, like let's be clear, the seed of the church is the blood of the martyrs. The Christian faith and Christian theology is dripping in blood. It doesn't even start on a cross. It starts with the people of Israel, right? So people who are beginning to talk about what is the spirituality of the sufferer, they're not denying the prophetic at all, and they're not denying the pastoral, but they are pulling out something that we have forgotten, I think, in American Christianity. We've forgotten that there is a spirituality of suffering that is dignified in our tradition and has nothing to do at all with what other people do or do not give us. And it really is, it's tragic for me because anytime I preach, I think, well, gosh, I'm only hearing the voices that don't, if I'm looking at commentate, you know, commentaries, I'm only looking at the voices that aren't actually noticing how that man becomes Jesus for this chapter. What does that mean about what I'm bringing to my people? Char, you had your hand up. Yeah. One thing that struck me about the Matthew 25 text as you were uh, going through it is as people are fed and clothed, this isn't a healing process. This is not uh, a changing of their condition, per se, as much as meeting them in their humanity. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be the site where Jesus is present, is the meaning of their humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, Gregory Ignazianzas, I, I appreciate that you mentioned that, you know, which side is Jesus on in the story? Jesus isn't the side of the, the provider. Jesus isn't the side of the one being provided for. And that's the site of divine location. Mm -hmm. um, Gregory Ignazianzas says um, that same thing, that, like, when we encounter uh, the poor, the hungry, the, 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 we should ex understand and expect that Jesus is on the other side of the encounter. That mm -hmm. we're not the ones being Jesus. Right. And so I actually think with the John 9 text, as I read Matthew 25 as kind of a lens for understanding this text, um, that it's not so much about this man's healing or being redeemed from blindness as much as being in a place of being met in his need. And maybe part of that need could even be, you know, ostracization from the community. That's right. Right. Um, but it's that side of... Um, needing someone in their need, that's the divine encounter more so than the healing. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think some of the angles in which you can kind of look at a text um, that may create, in, in terms of imagination, a, a liberative point to it. So, like, when you were talking about abuse theologies, you know, if someone strikes you on the cheek, off them the other, if someone oppresses you into service to carry their cargo for one mile, go with them two miles. Mm -hmm. and, and I think part of that is if someone's going to strike me on one cheek, if I'm going to offer them the other, that means I've got to stand there and mm -hmm. turn my head mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and let them hit that. And mm -hmm. It's kind of a sense of you're not, I'm not afraid of you. I'm not going to run from you. I'm not going to be intimidated by you. I'm going to stand firm here and I'm not going to cooperate with this violence. Mm -hmm. I think also, you know, in Palestinian Judaism that time was occupied by the Roman Empire, the Roman soldier could press someone into service to carry their cargo right. for right. one mile. Right. And then at one mile, they would say, if your hand is up, right. you right. can put it down, right. and then you can lift it up. But then to go a second mile right. is to say, right. oh, you, you still need help, so I'll go another mile with you. You know, it's kind of like responding to the oppression yes. with charity. Yes. That this is not going to define me, yeah. but my goodwill does define and I find that a bit, a bit liberal. Yes, yes. And actually, I'm, I am stunned by my capacity to use time, which is now almost over. Um, my time is almost over. But if I had had more time, there's actually, I recommended this last year, and I really highly encourage it this year, um, that there is a sermon that a colleague of mine who is a Korean adopted trans man uh, preached, and he preached it on that text. 
And he didn't just, he, he did some of the exegesis that you're doing right there. So talking about what it might, act, what Jesus might actually be doing that's subversive in saying that. It still doesn't make it any easier though, because at the end of the day, you're telling somebody who's being conscripted by the Romans, pick up that pack again and go another mile. You're telling somebody who's been slapped in the face, let them slap you again. Yes, in order to disrupt these cycles. Yes, in order to be just um, subversive. Yes, in order to show up the barbarism, the inhumanity of the other person, that's true. But in order to do that, you, the oppressed, the sufferer, the marginalized, have to put your body on the line again. So yes, it is a subversive and liberative text, but it still asks something of you. And so this colleague of mine is preaching that. What does it mean for me to hear the liberation from Jesus in this text, but then also to hear the ask, will you turn your other cheek, my queer, trans, adopted, Korean, in Minnesota child, will you turn the other cheek in order to disrupt the path of destruction that this world is on? Your other cheek. And that, to me, I think, is what makes this um, ultimately a dark night kind of spirituality. I don't know, how many people are familiar with the dark night of the, of the soul? Okay, so this is a kind of spirituality that says that when we come to our life of prayer, especially contemplative prayer, that's what we're here talking about, at some point we hit some kind of impasse. And this, just isn't, this isn't just dryness, there are these experiences that we have of feeling powerless, everything that we thought would work, Everything that had brought us consolation and a sense of understanding of God's presence, it just, it disappears. There's a breakdown of communication and a loss of desire. Julian says this most poignant thing. She says that the servant goes to do the Lord's work and immediately falls into the ditch and experiences all of these pains. One of those pains is that he nearly forgets his own love. Now that just... I don't know if you've ever known that pain in your life of prayer where it just gets so anguished at some point you just forget that you're in it because you love God. You just forget. Um, there's a seeming paralysis. You can't go forward, you can't go backwards. There's just kind of like a stuckness and a preoccupation with the problem. What am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? How can I change my prayer? So people who are really experiencing a dark night, they can be in danger of kind of scruples, right? I did everything wrong. And part of that is because we are broken people, so we haven't done everything right. And so all of the mistakes just glare at us when we're in that place of just feeling abandoned. And so there's not just a preoccupation with the problem, but there's also a pervasiveness of the problem. These two psalms, I love these psalms, I really do. Um, I love the pathos in them and they just break my heart because this one, this one says, um, you have taken all my friends away from me and darkness is my only companion. The end, then Psalm 89. This one says, turn your face from me before I go my way and am no more. Like, God, get out of here. I can't take any more of this, like relent. The end, Psalm 40. These are the only two psalms in the Psalter that just end on a note of like, this is terror, this is too dark, I can't bear it. And I love it because they have the pathos of a dark night experience. I wonder if it sounds like anything that's familiar to you as you listen and watch the world around us. The dark night is not something that's just disembodied in our spiritual lives. It's something that is happening all around us in our race, in our gender, in our sexuality, in our capitalism, in our white fragility, in our impetus to change the things that we thought we could change for justice. It happens so slowly. It happens so suddenly. It is safe and then it is not. When it happens, we are certain about everything, and then the fall strips us of knowing and doing 
and leaves us with being. Together we fall, sweaty, shattered, and gulping the darkness. This is the dark night of our communities. The place where, as Constance Fitzgerald says, this is another one of my muses, our experience of God and our spirituality it must emerge from our concrete historical situation and must return to that situation to feed it and enliven it. What if, by chance, our time in evolution is a dark night time, a time of crisis and, tradition, and transition that must be understood if it is to be part of learning a new vision and harmony for the human species and the planet? What she's saying is that these times that we live in we can see them as a collapse, we can see them as terror, we can enter into despair, or we can take courage from the spiritual, spirituality that the Carmelites put before us, this dark night spirituality, to say that now is the moment in which God's spirit can, if we are willing to fall to our knees and look into the void. This is a time when God can do something with us that we cannot do with ourselves. This is the moment where what will rise up is not just the uprising of black people on the street or trans people on the street or poor people on, in a campaign. They won't just rise up for justice, but out of their bowels and their groans and their wails and their prayer, if they are properly supported by community, will rise up the sapientia the wisdom, the Sophia of God that alone can put us on a different course. It's not gonna come from white people or cis people or straight people or rich people choosing to give something up. It's going to come from them choosing to bow down to the sight of God's revelation, which is in the sufferer in her dark night. And so my argument would be that if you want to really participate in that, this is actually Barbara Holmes, so I'll, I'll read this. During crisis contemplation, and that's what she calls this, how do we in the places of our suffering? So for me, again, talking about race, body, vocation, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? The sufferer in me is asking the sufferer in you. During crisis contemplation, all the systems that we have put in place to undergird our fantasies collapse and fall headlong into the power of divine intention and the mystery of an inner and outer cosmos. In the midst of collective free fall, there is blessed darkness that creeps over our state of shock. We have tried through our religious systems to avoid this. We have glorified the light made sacrifices to its heat, and yet it is the darkness that welcomes us when we let go. I just love that as a brown-skinned person, I'm just going to say. Thank goodness for the darkness that blankets our free falls through the crisis and into the rich loom of contemplative potential. I am grateful that when we are at our lowest point, a portal opens that beckons us toward healing and restoration. In the midst of crisis, we are given the opportunity to shed simplified versions of reality from multidimensional and mystical spaces. She's talking about our common life as a society, having access to mystical spaces when we are willing to plummet together into the warm loom of our darkness. I highlighted this word opportunity because it, it is worth saying I have to stop so there, is, there are a number of slides that I won't get to. Um, but it is worth saying that one of the caveats here, there are a number of caveats, a number of caveats. And the first is that I think it has to be the sufferer who feels called into this work. 
you as an oppressor, you as somebody of a privileged vantage point don't get to say to somebody, hey, you know, actually, could you just accept your suffering so that we could all get to a higher mystical state? Like, that is not, that's not a thing. Don't do that. I also don't believe God wants anybody to perish out of a false theology. So if you don't have the support to look into your suffering, to look your suffering in the face, um, that's our fault. That's not your fault. That's my community's fault. It's not my fault if I don't have that. And don't kill yourself by not receiving God's love, pastoral care, prophetic rage. So none of that. Because the truth is that when Barbara Holmes talks about an opportunity, she's also really conscious. And as somebody who was trained and worked in psychology, I am also really conscious that for people who are at that breaking point around something, trauma, anything like that, there is that potential. And there is also the potential for collapse. There's always a razor edge where we're being transformed or where we just sort of disintegrate. And it takes community and grace and a real call to walk towards that. So alas, I have to stop. Um, and maybe I will end just with my last two poems and that'll be it. This is from Rilke. You, darkness of whom I am born, I love you more than the flame that limits the world to the circle it illuminates and excludes all the rest. But the dark embraces everything. Shapes and shadows, creatures and me, people, nations, just as they are. It lets me imagine a great presence stirring beside me. I believe in the night. And Barbara Holmes ends us. For the crises, the disruption of order, and the plunge into contemplation, we are grateful. For the welcoming darkness and the wounds that bring us to a place of unknowing, we thank God. For the nurture of our many villages of belonging, we are grateful for healing that comes in unexpected ways and the imaginative paths of futurism and cosmic rebirth. Thanks be. Amen. Thank you.